Yeah, I really want to speak from my heart because as I thought about what in the world to share today, um, this is really what stands out. And I want to begin with a story, but before I, before I share the story, I should say this, you know, after being in, in pastoral ministry for over 15 years, you know, you, you see a lot, you experience a lot, but there's a first time for everything, right? So I got uh, uh, two first time moments, um, preparing a sermon in, in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, the airport, the little, little corner of the airport was definitely an experience and trying to prepare the message even further on the airplane with a very weird setup with the chairs. I mean, the chairs, the seats went back like at a 45 degree angle. I mean, they went back a lot. And so I literally like typing like this as my laptop's like at an acute angle. I can barely see anything I'm typing and falling asleep in the midst of it. But um, the joy of the Lord is my strength. You know, and um, everyone keeps saying, oh, you must be so tired. And, and I am, I think, because I actually feel pretty good right now. And I really believe it's because the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I really feel it. And it was such an amazing experience. I'm still kind of in, in being blessed by the, uh, the energy um, that we gained through, through this experience. But anyway, the other first time was experience was coming straight to worship um, after arriving at <laughs> the airport this morning. God is good. And there's a story that for me just kind of frames this entire experience and really it begins before before the trip even began. So I remember I shared last Sunday how I was in the Palm Desert with Isaiah last week because he had a golf tournament. And every morning we, we, we had a brief time of prayer and just going over the word, just a brief time. And um, it turned out that, that we just meditated on the same verse every single day that, that we were there. And um, that verse is Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. And we'll read it in a moment, but that verse really just kind of, really helped us kind of frame um, this tournament for him. You know, it's about trusting in the Lord, no matter what the outcome. And, and just knowing that God has a purpose and God has a plan, the steadfast of mind, you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For in God the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. And we talk about, you know, what does that mean? An everlasting rock, what does that mean? And we share about it a little bit. And I think that perspective helped Isaiah. He played very well this tournament, and it was a great experience um, for us. So fast forward to last Sunday. Of course, after our service, I went, uh, Jeff and I went to spend some time with the team because the team had already been at the base in YYMLA doing some training for a few days before they left for the trip. And so Jeff and I were able to at least be there on Sunday and, and spend time and get to know the missionaries there and, and to encourage the team and get some activities together it was great. Each of the YMLA uh, missionaries wrote a card for every single one of us in our team. And um, that card was a reflection of things they had been praying for us. Even though we had never met them before, I certainly had never met the person um, that wrote my card before, a brother named Tucker, who was doing all the multimedia or the, the Instagram stuff. Um, so if I sent the link, um, a lot of that is video footage from Tucker, who's kind of taking care of that out there. So Tucker wrote the card for me, and I was immediately taken aback when I saw his card, it was very encouraging, but what was most encouraging about it was the verse he shared, which is at the top. Wow. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, is a rock eternal. Now, what are the chances something like that happens? I mean, it's not like Isaiah 26 is a popular chapter in Isaiah. It's kind of an obscure one, actually. It talks about judgment leading into this. And, and I was just taken aback by that experience. And, and immediately was struck by, as I then reflected on this season of my life and some different struggles I had been wrestling with, some of which I shared about last Sunday, just this notion of God as our rock. 
God as our rock. God as my fortress. God as the, my refuge and as the one in whom I can look to and no matter what is going on around me, that he's there, that he's strong, that he's immovable, that he is my fortress. And it really started to hit home as the Holy Spirit obviously brought this connection together. It was not mere coincidence by any stretch of the imagination. This was the work of the Holy Spirit. But the story's not done yet. So I'm deeply encouraged by this. And of course, we left on Monday for the trip. And as we learn more about the land, because honestly, I really had no idea what I was getting into. I think there was so much going on before the trip. I had not done much research. Um, and so I was grateful that you know Jeff and I traveled together for many reasons. One of the things we were concerned about is would we still like each other when the, when the trip is over? Because we spent a lot of time together. So one of the other prayer praise reports is that Jeff and I still love one another as brothers. And uh, it was really critical actually that there's two of us because there's so much, so much going on. We need to kind of partner and, and, and figure things out to get back home, especially. Uh, but it was a great time. We had a lot of fun. And I told Jeff on the way here this morning that if we could do it all over again, I would do it in a heartbeat. I'm not sure if Jeff feels the same way. But anyway, here we are. As we learn more about the land in Brazil, and as we, as we actually saw the topography of the land, I didn't realize that the area we were going to, called Chapada dos Guimarães, I think is why you pronounce it, but that word Chapada means canyons. And so there's these amazing canyons, like the Grand Canyon almost, it looks like, um, a, a slightly smaller version of that. So as we're driving you know, to the village from the base, it's about a four and a half hour drive. Some of it on paved roads, but much of it on very dusty dirt roads. Um, we stopped off at this one particular area. It's kind of a, a place where people stop to sightsee. And that's a picture I took from there. And it, the picture, like Jeff was mentioning, doesn't quite do justice to when you actually see the person. And when I look and saw that structure, it was amazing that God, once again, was affirming the truth that He had revealed before I left. God is the eternal rock. And as we keep our eyes on the eternal rock, as we continue to trust in our eternal rock, life becomes pretty unshakable. Yes, there's doubts, yes, there's questions, Yes, the winds blow and the storms come and the fire burns. But as we keep our eyes on the rock, we can remain firm and steadfast ourselves. So this continued, this amazing experience just kind of affirmed for me as I thought about what to share with us today, that this was clearly something the Lord had put on my heart to share. As we think about God as our eternal rock, I think there's really three, three aspects of that that I'd like to, to, to share about today, the three aspects of it that really stood out to me. And I'm using fancy kind of, you know, theology words, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll break it down further. But that God is the rock of our salvation. God is the rock of our fortification. And God is the rock of our sanctification. And let's talk about that. God is the rock of our salvation. The rock of our salvation. This is from 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laid in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And the stone of stumbling and a rock 
of offense. They stumbled because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. So Apostle Peter talks about how we, through Christ, the cornerstone, and we know the cornerstone is the, the foundation of the building. It's that critical aspect of ancient archaeology. That cornerstone is very, very important. It's, it's, it's really the foundation. That through Christ, the foundational cornerstone, we have become living stones. We have become a people that He is building up into His church, His body. And it's that salvation that we have received through our rock, Jesus Christ, that has saved us. But it's that same rock that is also the rock of offense. It's that same rock upon which people also stumble. For those who put their faith in Christ, He is that rock of salvation. For those who reject Christ, He becomes the rock of offense and the rock of judgment. And it made me think further about the reality that salvation is not cheap grace. It's not a soft gospel. And I was taking it too literally, but a rock is literally hard, right? And the gospel of our salvation is not some soft gospel. And made me think about how even for us, as, especially for us, I should say, as believers who have been in the church, some of us for a long time, that we've almost become a little too comfortable in Christ. That, that the gospel is meant to afflict the comfortable as much as it is to comfort the afflicted, as is often said. And, of course, in the context of a mission and the discomforts of it and some of the challenges of it, although it really wasn't that bad, but still, obviously, there's a change from your normal routine. I get a taste of that reality that... It's through the, the difficulty and the challenge that the glory and the worthiness of it really comes out. You really see it. And I realize the gospel cannot be preached and, and received as a soft gospel. One where, you know, our, our faith, it just becomes this, this thing that helps us just to be nice people. And, and people that come to church on Sundays and do good Christian things... We, we can be satisfied with that kind of a gospel, but it, it, that's not the gospel of our salvation. The gospel of our salvation demands that we take up our cross and follow Him. It demands that we die to ourselves in order to truly live. And praise God for that, because that's a gospel worthy of our lives. Not a gospel of, yeah, you know, just believe, God loves you, you know, enjoy this Christian subculture and church life and doing nice things and being a decent person. That's not a gospel that saves us from the depths of hell. A gospel that saves us from the depths of hell is one that was rooted in the death and crucifixion of Jesus upon a cross and the blood that was shed that redeems all who call upon the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sin. And because of how worthy that gospel is, it's a gospel that demands everything. It's a gospel that's free because Jesus paid the price, but it's also a gospel that demands that we die to our pride. That we die to everything that, that, that we want in ourselves, in our sinful nature, and to die and crucify our pride so that the life of Christ may live in us. That's not a popular message because people don't want to crucify their pride. I mean, the pride is that one thing that keeps us from God the most. And unless we're willing to die to our pride and surrender all of that to the Lord and say yes to, the, to what is so much better that He's offering us, then we're not going to know what true salvation looks like. Even if we're in church for our entire lives. Even if we've heard sermons and had some emotional encounters. Even if we, we read our Bible and, and do the right things. 
The question is, have we truly come to terms with the gospel that demands our all? That's really stood out to me as I thought about God as the rock of our salvation. The rock. He is worthy. He is strong. He is everything. Is the gospel that we believe a gospel that's worthy? Or is it a gospel that was easy? He's the rock of our salvation, but he's also the rock of offense. And the question for us, that I, just want to, I, know, I ask this question a lot, but it's because for me, my biggest fear as a pastor is that, that there are some, if not perhaps more than I would hope, in our ministry that never truly came to understand the depth of the gospel. That believing in Jesus became really easy for us, or was very comfortable for us, or cultural. But have we truly repented and surrendered our lives? It's a question I wrestle with myself. I never, I don't doubt my salvation, but it really convicts me. Is Jesus truly worthy of my all? Yes, he is. Have I given him my all? Really for us to just come to terms with, is God still the rock of offense to you? Is the idea of dying completely to yourself and living unto Christ, is that still a little offensive to you? A little like, eh, I'm not sure if I really want that. Then we have still not seen Jesus for who he truly is. And we need to come to terms with the reality. Am I really saved? Have I really repented? Or is Jesus kind of like my comfort zone? in a sense, in the wrong way. Let's really come to terms, brothers and sisters, with the reality that God is the rock of our salvation. But He's also the rock of offense. And we need to take that seriously. Because He is worthy of all of us. All of our hearts. All of our lives. Have we been saved by a gospel that demands our all? Or a gospel that just is, you know, pretty comfortable to believe. Something to think about. Maybe something we need to come to terms with today. The second part is that God is the rock of our fortification. Kind of a fancy way of saying that he's the rock of our refuge. He's the rock that has saved us and he's the rock that protects us. And you see this theme again and again in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms. And, and Psalm 18 is like probably the one psalm that, that's really like, it's like the original rock song. A rock song. You could even call it a rock song. The original rock song is Psalm 18 because it is a song written by King David. And, and he writes, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Now, as we read this, it can easily sound like, well, that's just the Bible. You know, that's just the Psalms. They kind, of, they kind of sound like that. But let's remember who wrote this and the context in which he was writing. King David went through a lot in his life. Talk about a man who has seen the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, who's constantly running from death. I mean, just the man who dealt with everything. His own deep, deep failures. Having the burden of leading not just a nation, but the chosen people of God, the chosen nation of Israel, to have that burden on your, your back is pretty substantial. This guy dealt with a lot, and in the midst of everything he had gone through, this is what he writes as he reflects on his life. I love you, O oh Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. I told you this is an original rock song. Rock song. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. We're going to jump ahead a little bit. These are just some excerpts here. As for God, His way is blameless. The word of the 
the Lord is tried. I love that. Basically, the word of the Lord, the word of God is tried and true. It, 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 it has gone the distance. It's timeless. It is everything. He is a shield to all. Take refuge in Him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Exalted be the God of my salvation. This is not just nice Christian phrases if for the sake of writing a nice song. This is King David pouring out his heart as he reflected on how much and how many times God has been the rock of refuge in his life in a very real way. And I almost wonder, because we knew we know he hid in caves, um, that you know, obviously in the palace that overlooked the mountains. I wonder if he was writing this inside of one of those caves in the mountains, just thinking about where he was and being in that environment, making him think about God as his rock. Maybe he was at his palace and as he overlooked the mountains, he just wrote this, thinking about God, that, that you, you've been my rock, just as I see. You know, God protects us from far more than we realize. And he has blessed us with, with this divine just protection in so many ways that we take for granted. We have to admit that. It's a blessing to just go to work and come home safe and sound just for just a day. It's a blessing to survive on the freeways of Los Angeles just for a day. There's some crazy stuff that happens out here. You never know. Okay, just leaving the house is, you know, you never know what's going to happen, especially in this area, right? It's tough. It's no small blessing. The protection that God has over us every single day. It makes me think about what a friend of mine who was in law enforcement for many years, he retired recently, in his training with the FBI, he shared with, with us, with me and Tracy and some of us, he, he shared how we have no idea how much the Department of Homeland Security protects us from every single day. We don't hear about the vast majority of it, but there are terror attacks that happen almost daily and how much they intercept it. It's crazy. And it reminds me of how God just, how He has been our refuge. He has been our protector in so many ways in our lives. But He doesn't protect us from everything. And there's things that God allows in our lives. We've talked about this many times, but it's worth saying again. God allows things. If He's our protector, then why does He allow certain things to happen in our lives that can be very painful and difficult, challenging to deal with? Well, it's because in those seasons, He wants us to see Him as that rock of refuge. He wants to draw us closer to Him, to humble us, and to just bring us to that place of desperation to realize how much we need Him. He allows those things to draw us back under His shelter again, to draw us closer to Him again. He is both the rock that protects us and the rock of our refuge when we're dealing with difficulties. We have to remember that. He's the God who sustains us in a very, very real way. You and I are standing here today because God has been our fortress, because God has been our refuge. He's been our shield. He's been our stronghold. And we praise Him for all the ways that He has been so faithful to us beyond what we could ever even recognize. Every breath is a gift from God. We praise Him for that. The last thing I want to mention is that the, God is the rock of our sanctification. He's the rock of our sanctification. And what came to mind as I thought about this is the parable of, of the wise builder, or the parable of the two foundations. Those who build their house on the rock, and those who build their house on the rock. The sin. And here's how the parable goes. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, 
Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now here's the thing that's very interesting to me. As much as I've known about this parable and have read this parable many times and have heard about it, what stood out to me is that Jesus gave the parable of the wise builder, or the two foundations, on a principle. On a principle. And what's that principle? Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, that's the principle. So this idea of building your house on the rock is not just some kind of, you know, this kind of idea of, yes, God is my foundation. He is. But specifically, this parable was spoken in the context of this principle. And this was very convicting to me. Because the church, in many ways, and I'm guilty of this as much as anyone else here is. We are so easily in this state where we hear the word over and over and over again, but we do not put it into practice. Right? I mean, there was a part of me that was like, you know what? I'm not gonna even prepare a sermon today. I'm just gonna ask that we remember what we learned last week. And if we say no, then we just do over it again. But I love you too much to do that, so I actually try to prepare a sermon. That being said, this is so important. If you do not put the Word of God into practice, then you are actually building your house in the sand. And what happens when the winds blow? What happens when life gets tough? The foundation will be revealed for what it is, and it won't hold up for very long. It's so critical for us as believers who hear the Word of God, not just on Sundays, some of us probably hear messages or different things even throughout the week. Are we exercising our faith? Are we putting what we learn into practice with intentionality every single day? Because if we're not, we are building our house on the wrong foundation. Doesn't mean we lose our salvation. That's not what Jesus is saying. Our foundation is in Him. But there's a very powerful principle here, isn't there? How intentional are you? How intentional am I? When we walk out of the doors of this church on Sunday, and we live our life, how intentional are we about putting these truths into practice daily? One of the things that really stood out to me about this mission trip, for me, this was the first time I've been out of the country. I mean, we've done missions in Mexico many times, but this is my first time in South America. And my first time out of the United States. I mean, I was born here. You know, I mean, I've never even been to Korea before. You know, I, I'd probably find my way around Brazil more than I'd find my way around Korea at this point. Um, so this is certainly a new experience. But what blessed me the most, it, it, it really by far, was the people we met, the, the people that was in the picture that Jeff shared. These people, and I'm not putting them on a pedestal, I'm just seeing them as an example of what faith looks like. They literally have to live their lives fully dependent on God. They have to exercise their faith in ways we never even consider doing here because we don't have to here you can easily be a, a, a so-called Christian and a churchgoer you could even be a genuine believer and not have to have faith pretty much at all there's food on the table you shelter you don't think about am I going to have something to wear today am I going to have something to eat later today those thoughts never even come to mind. In very, very few ways do we really need to exercise faith. 
But when you go and you meet people who tell you their stories of how God even, for example, allowed this YWAM base in Chapada to even exist. I mean, we're talking about they had nothing, nothing. And they're literally praying for God to bring furniture, refrigerator, you know, money to pay the rent for that month. And literally, with nothing, all of a sudden, people show up and this base is in the middle of nowhere. Like, I, don't, I had no idea where we were going when they were driving us into the base. It's like, what is this place? You know? It looked like an abandoned road, but we kept going. And all of a sudden, there's this base. And you hear the stories of people after they pray. People bringing refrigerator after refrigerator after refrigerator out of nowhere. I mean, literally, furniture out of nowhere. People just show up at their door. I know that sounds far-fetched, and like, yeah, I mean, did that really happen? Yes, it did. I mean, it's unbelievable, the testimonies and the stories you hear, because they had to exercise their faith. It wasn't an option. They have to live in faith. That really convicted me, because in so many ways we don't. And so the challenge for us, it's not so much, well, then should we live in poverty and just trust in God to provide our every need? Well, if God convicts you to do that, then go ahead and do that. The question for us is, how can we intentionally live our lives in a way where we have to exercise faith? To actually put ourselves in some state of vulnerability where we don't have control. And that's an issue because we really like control. We really like routines. And to get outside of that is really uncomfortable for us. But in what ways can we, even in little ways, give up some of that control? And really put ourselves intentionally in these positions where God has to come through. Now I don't know what that looks like. Maybe it's just this little act of boldness. You know, may, maybe it's just finally being faithful in your daily devotions and really spending time in God's Word. Maybe it's just sharing the gospel and, and, and getting a little bit out of that comfort zone to offer to pray for someone you don't know that well or whatever it might be. Or literally sharing the gospel with somebody. Whatever it is. Can we intentionally practice and exercise our faith. I walk away from this short experience in Brazil realizing how rich, how rich our faith can become when we experience things outside of our comfort zone. And I know, you know, we can be very satisfied with, well, I'm pretty good with the faith I have right now, right? But there's so much more. And it's such a blessing. Can we be intentional, church? To see a greater richness in our faith? Because we really learn to trust in God in ways that get us out of our comfort zones. You will not regret it. You will not regret it. I want to just close by sharing about our team specifically a little bit. From a pastoral standpoint, how full my heart has been. Seeing every single member of our team all in, 110%. And I'm talking about every single one of them. I'm just so blessed seeing how God is moving and how God is stirring the hearts of our fellow brothers and sisters in living water. Hearing Jacob share devotional for our team and the YWAM missionaries. Seeing the, the, the efforts of our high school girls, you know, Audrey, the two Audrey's, Audrey H, Audrey P, right, Elise, Noel, how they're just reaching out in, in these, these powerful ways to the, the local kids and taking that, that youthful, 
kind of LWC youthful uh, heart and love for children and just extending that 6,000 miles away. It's just amazing to see that. It's amazing to see what God is doing um, in our team, seeing Brother David just in his element. I mean, that man was born to be a missionary. He just loves just serving God and, and, and how much Sharon is such a blessing and how much Brother David needs Sharon. Uh, Sharon just is an amazing sister. Uh, Julia's just steadfastness and resourcefulness has been amazing. Um, John is being John, you know, that's steadfast. Uh, but I can see the, the, the encouragement in his eyes, seeing Edwin just really blossoming and growing in his faith and playing soccer with the kids and um, even getting baptized in the river there in Brazil. Wow. I could go on and on and on, but I'll stop with that just to say I too am still processing a lot of things. But I just want to leave us with this very, very important truth. God is our rock, church. God is our rock. He's our rock of salvation. Trust in Him. Let us truly believe the gospel of Jesus Christ that demands our all but gives us infinitely more. God is our shelter. He is our shield. He is our stronghold. He is our rock. Run to Him. Don't carry the burden on your heart. There's a reason for the trial we're going through. And the longer we wait, it's just wasted time. God's wanting to draw you closer to Him. Draw near to Him. He's your refuge. And God is the rock of our sanctification. He's challenging us so that we can experience more, to be willing to live in greater faith, to be willing to put ourselves in positions where we're vulnerable, where we really have to trust in Him. And when we see Him come through, we'll get a taste of what King David felt when he's writing these amazing words, telling God how much He loves Him and how much God has been His refuge. To have a richness to our faith that we could never have if we remain in our comfort. Allow the Holy Spirit to challenge you. I pray you challenge me. And that we can continue walking faithfully with Christ who is our rock, our stronghold. Let's spend a moment right now in prayer.